Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship here at St. John's. It is truly a blessing to gather together to give thanks and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, it is a beautiful day to gather. If you have a special prayer request that you would like named in today's prayer, um, if you would fill that out on that little sheet inside your, the registration form, along with any address changes or anything that uh, may have occurred in the last few months, please do so, and we will remember them by name and prayer. And now we stand together and face the cross at the back of the sanctuary for our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your way the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together in our gathering hymn, 669, Rise Up, O Saints of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare to hear the word. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 19. At Sinai, God assured Israel you shall be my treasured possession, and commissioned them to serve as mediating priests for the nations. The people committed themselves completely to God's will. Exodus 19, beginning with verse 2 through verse 8a. The Israelites had journeyed from Rehab Hermium, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you, sh you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be with before me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. 
So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. The word of the Lord. A reading from Psalm 100. Please read with me responsibly. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. For he with gladness come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Okay. And his thoughts with Give thanks to him. His name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 5. Because Jesus' sacrifice brought us into right relationship with God, we are no longer enemies of God but have peace with him. A person in relationship with Jesus is strengthened to endure suffering and has a sure hope of salvation. Romans 5, 1 through 8. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained, obtained access to his grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The mission of Jesus' followers is to continue the mission of Jesus himself. Here, he instructs his first disciples how they might proclaim the gospel through their words and deeds. As the gospel is extended this morning, please be seated at this time. From the Gospel of St. Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples 
and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out as sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite uh, Carter, Parker, do you guys want to come up this morning? I've got some cool stuff here to show you. In fact, I bet you already have these in your own room. Do you want to come on up today? Brave soul that you are. All right, boys, are you going to come up too? Good morning, Caleb. Come on up, boys. I bet you know what this is, don't you? Hmm? What's this? Tell you what, this is an easier one. What's that? Nightlight. Nightlight, of course. And why does everybody have a nightlight in their room? So when you don't, so when you can see when it's on, you don't run into stuff by accident. So you can see at night when it's dark. You don't run into stuff by accident. And if a kid is really little, maybe they're afraid of what? Like if there's monsters in the closet. Right, their imagination just runs wild and... They're afraid of the dark sometimes, aren't they, right? So we put a nightlight into our rooms because having just a little bit of light helps us feel better, doesn't it? Absolutely. We're not nearly as scared if there's just a little bit of light. We don't normally light this big, tall Christ candle here in the season after the day of Pentecost But today I wanted to light it especially because we know that Jesus is with us and we know also, we believe, we tell everyone that Jesus is the light of the world. 
The light that shines in the darkness and the darkness never overcomes Jesus. Jesus is more powerful, stronger, bigger than anything in the dark. And even the darkness is not dark for Jesus. So, as you have a nightlight in your room, do you have a nightlight in your room? Of course you do. I do too, right? You don't want to do that, do you? You don't want to stub your toe or run into the wall at all. No. What's that? Oh, that's terrible. Man, I've never broken a bone in my body, and I hope I never do. I'm told it's very painful, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah, I bet it does. I bet it does, right? So when you look at the little nightlight in your room, you can remember that Jesus is the light of the world and that because Jesus is with you, you don't ever need to be afraid of anything at all. Jesus is always with you. Would you fold your hands, please? I'm going to say a quick little prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus, the light of the world, into our hearts and lives. Bless these young boys, watch over them, bless all the children in our midst, bless families everywhere, that the light of Jesus Christ might shine brightly in their lives. We pray all of these things in his holy name, amen. Thanks, boys, you guys are good sports. I hope you don't break any more bones too, all right? Yeah, that's right. You guys can be seated. Thank you for coming forward today. Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from the one who is the light of the world, the one in whom there is no darkness. Amen. We're coming up on the first day of summer, 21st of June, aren't we? The day when you have the longest period of daylight in all the year. Isn't it something, I've always thought that maybe we should celebrate the light of Christ when there is the most light in the Northern Hemisphere. That's a little aside. I don't want to take any time for that, but I did want to mention it. So when you think of July, June 21st, you'll think of Jesus Christ as the light of the world. Well, dear sisters and brothers, we know that sometimes the world is challenging and darker than we might prefer, certainly more troubling than God would ever have or wish. So it is that he sends the light of the world into our lives so that we can, in our struggles, be sustained. In our weariness, we might be strengthened. Amidst our difficulties and challenges, we might have hope and encouragement. The second lesson today uh, talks about all of those things in a nutshell. Paul, who is always very concise with his language, brief with his words and gets right to the heart of the matter, says, you know, there will be times when you will, when you will boast in the glory of God. Times like weddings and baptisms and new babies being born and anniversaries. Times when your heart overflows with joy, you will boast in the glory of God. But if Jesus Christ is with us, and he is, then Paul says also this, you may boast even in your sufferings. You may boast even in your sufferings. That would not seem like an encouraging word all by itself, alone, but as Jesus is the one who suffered on the cross and triumphed then over death, was raised again to new life, so we have a little glimpse, a picture in advance, a little foretaste of the feast to come as we sing in the liturgy of why it is that we too may boast in our sufferings. Because looking back, we know, we trust, we confess, we believe that our sufferings will give way to blessing and life when we enter the kingdom of God, and when we come into the fullness of that kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Until that time, we have also this encouragement that we are not orphaned, that Jesus does not leave us alone, that he, in fact, is with us, Emmanuel, Christ with us, every step of the way, every day 
of our lives. Because the suffering that St. Paul talks about here that produces endurance and then character and then hope, which reminds us that God's love has been given and will be fulfilled to us, this kind of suffering through which with agony and groaning, pain and suffering, we sometimes encounter in this life. And this is not the ordinary sort of suffering, like having a bad week at work or children that frustrate you, right? At home or at school. This isn't the sort of everyday, commonplace annoyances. That's not what Paul is writing about. Paul is writing about the type of suffering. How is it that it glorifies God? Paul is writing about the type of suffering that we can barely endure. That by ourselves, we would not be able to stand. That left alone to our own devices, we would be crushed. But because God's Holy Spirit is with us, we may be perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We may be broken, but we are not shattered. We may find it difficult to go one more step ahead. But in the love of God, with Christ Jesus, there is a brother or sister in Christ who is there to take us by the hand and hold us by the arm and go with us that next step. And I think this is the testimony and the glory of God that Paul writes about in such suffering because when the time of suffering has passed and when the hurt and pain has been alleviated, then how often do we not find, dear friends, that such a person is yet stronger in their faith? How is that possible? The world would say, you have been broken and you would give up. But in fact, what we see, the brothers and sisters whom we ourselves know and live with, oftentimes, more often than not, are sustained, are restored, are encouraged, and their faith is stronger than ever. I think their renewed faith and strength is what Paul must be writing about when he says that we boast even in our sufferings and that even our sufferings might glorify God because we might endure them together and rely upon the Holy Spirit. St. Paul writes towards the end of Romans, perhaps after his own time of suffering is lessened, St. Paul writes, I do not consider the present sufferings of this present life worth comparing to the glory that is about to be revealed to us. But notice, Paul says this at the right time, after the most difficult period has passed. And in this, perhaps there is wisdom that we might look at the experiences of others that we with tenderness might see the difficulty through which they have gone and with gentleness in our voices and kindness in our hands. We might learn from their experience and see, see how God has sustained them in that difficult time. Sisters and brothers in Christ, if you have undergone these kind of sufferings, peace be with you. The good news is this. A new day will come. The Lord will not leave your side. And the Holy Spirit itself intercedes for you on your behalf with our Father in heaven. With sighs that are too deep for words. With words that are more powerful and effective and comforting than we could ever begin to imagine. Peace be with all of you sisters and brothers in Christ. Amen. Let us join our hearts and voices in singing hymn number 700.
and 96. stand together as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare our hearts for prayer. Call together in the Spirit's embrace, let us pray for the mending of God's world. Steadfast God, you send your church as laborers into your harvest. Heal our divisions and unite us in mission. Make us one at your table. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful creator, protect your earth and breathe life into its future. Stir our hearts to compassion that we become healers for the sake of your whole creation as it is made new. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy One, you desire peace for all nations. Give rulers and citizens wisdom in the use of power, that wars may cease and all who suffer exile, hunger and tear find safe haven. Lord, in your mercy, compassionate one, you have brought us to yourself. 
stay near to all who suffer broken hearts, fearful spirits, and disruptive illness. We pray especially this morning for Carolyn and Shirley and Val and Sam, Kim and Edna, Deanna, Mary, Richard, Kurt, Gloria, Vernon. We pray prayers for the families who have been touched and now walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray for the family of Mary Ann Hartman, her sisters Joyce, Diane, Donna, and Debbie, and their spouses and all of her friends. We pray for the family of Ken Jacobson, his wife Shirley, and his entire family. We pray for Chris Knapp's father, Sam, be with her family as they mourn his loss. Lord, in your mercy, all these things, and for whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us share the peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And now we continue our worship with our offering as we give of ourselves, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Let us worship the Lord.
Let us pray. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Fill us each and every time that we come to your table. Lord, in your mercy. For on the night in which was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, given for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The feast is ready, and all are welcome. Come now.
for the blessing and prayer. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, you open your hand and feed us with this bread and cup, your very self. It is truly a feast of great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. Let us join together in our sending hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4 of 800. And 58. Praise to the Lord. Be seated. Briefly, we want to highlight just a few announcements for you today. You'll find the people in your bulletin on page 8 who are in our prayers this week. We please invite you to take your bulletin home with you. And our Reformation video this morning. When you look at the story of Luther's life, 1525 was not a calm year. The Peasants' Revolt threatened war across the countryside, and theological fights intensified as Luther continued to preach and write. For example, that year he wrote a scathing rebuke of the famous theologian Erasmus, titled On the Bondage of the Will. Can you imagine getting married during such a time? Luther did just that. And by all accounts, it shocked everyone. Once a zealous monk holding firm to his religious vows, he now abandoned that way of life for a very different path. What Luther came to understand to be a path ordained by God. Luther's views on marriage evolved the more he became familiar with the content of scripture. He came to understand that the vow of celibacy monks and nuns take actually dishonors God's created order. The vows reflect a basic misunderstanding of what it means to be spiritual and how it is God shows favor to his people. How so? Luther understood that marriage and its intended purpose of having children honors God's created order. God's favor is found in the command he gave to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And so the marriage of a man and a woman to establish a family is a vocation God gives us so we can participate in his creative work in the world. Luther recognized that scripture time and again speaks of the gift of children given to a mother and father as being evidence of God's bountiful blessing, both physical and spiritual. While Luther understood marriage as a holy estate, he was realistic about what it meant for the man and the woman. Inevitably, hardships and conflicts arise as part of being a spouse and parent. By recognizing that God ordains these vocations, you can be strengthened in these times fending off the devil's attempts to undermine the holy estate of Christian marriage. All of this was said and done so you can remember. 
a mighty fortress is our God. All right, if you're visiting today, welcome. Uh, please uh, pick up a gift bag on your way out of church. We have a few slides I'd like to show you today from the flag-raising ceremony of Tucker Heron's Eagle Scout Project. It was a great time during vacation Bible school. We had 86 kids in attendance for VBS. There you can see Mayor Kirkhoff and the Wasmer Post 241 American Legion, and then off to the left, Tucker Heron and the Scouts of Troop 188. We've got some other pictures to show you. There's Tucker giving his address. He did a marvelous job, spoke very eloquently. Here's the flag raising itself, pretty neat. This is a good friend of the congregation, Staff Sergeant Eric Armstrong of the 185th RTI. And again, our beautiful new flag and flagpole. So thanks to Tucker Heron for the good work that he did on that project. It's been a real blessing. To tell you about another blessing, we'd like to invite Kay Michelson and Mark Stelzer forward to share with you some exciting news. Well, um, as you can see in the picture on the slide, uh, we are welcoming this young family to our congregation later this summer. Michael Rathke and his wife Kirsten accepted the job offer that was offered to them for Minister of Music and Minister of Youth. And we are very delighted that they accepted that offer. Um, I would ask that you continue to keep this young family in your prayers as they relocate from their home in Rapid City to Lamar's this summer, and also to keep all of us in prayer too as we help assimilate them into our congregation and into the positions that we um, hired them to do. And speaking from the council, we are delighted to have this young family joining us. Um, in case somebody didn't know, Michael is the Minister of Music, and Kirsten is the Minister of Youth and Education. And we are just thrilled. This is the culmination of many, many, many years, decade or two, <laughs> of, of thoughts and prayers in this regard. So thank you for your prayers of support for them and for uh, ongoing. If Kirsten's face looks familiar, that's because uh, her father is the band instructor at uh, the high school and her mother is an English teacher at the high school. Her maiden name is Orland. So welcome to Michael and Kirsten and their three boys. Kids are going off to camp this summer. You can find a list of their names in your bulletin. There's also newsletters out there if you want the comprehensive list. But please do jot them a note, send them a postcard. If you get it in the mail by Tuesdays, they'll get it before they leave camp. It's always a lot of fun. Next Sunday, the 25th, at the late service, it will be outdoors at Cleveland Park. And regardless of whatever service you might attend that weekend, we invite you to the congregational picnic at Cleveland Park following the 1045 service. So it's going to be a great time. Sign up out there in the lobby so we know how many people to prepare food for. Newsletter deadline is coming right up, and there it went. So with that, please stand for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. <laughs>